Uh, so won't spend much time on this, but uh, as Vince has already given me an introduction, but um, just mentioned on, on the bottom line there, uh, one of my philosophies when it comes to chemical treatment is that no one single molecule can really do it all. And so one of the things I've done a fair bit of work on in the last several years is finding how to put chemistries together to get a better result from blending those chemistries together and delivering, uh, uh, let's call it a, a best in class or a, a, a highest performing type of product out there in the field. And especially as the industry trends toward a lot more water reuse, these types of approaches are really going to become more than normal. So speaking about scale, uh, we'll go through uh, why scale forms, uh, the mechanisms of how it forms, and then we're going to talk about how we can control scale by attacking the mechanisms by which it forms. Many scale types, uh, uh, and I'm focus focusing this more towards this area, uh, barium sulfate, calcium carbonate will be two of the big ones, iron oxide to a lesser degree. Uh, and some iron sulfide. I don't really recall much of this area having sour production yet, but if that comes down the road, iron sulfide will definitely rear its ugly head like it has in many areas. Uh, in most cases, the uh, it's purely a mixing of incompatible ions, so too much strontium and too much sulfate, uh, too much sulfate, too much barium and too much sulfate uh, together. Uh, Calcium carbonate is slightly different from the rest of them for a few things. Uh, it's very pH dependent. So the higher your pH, typically you're going to make calcium carbonate a much more of a problem. And also it is one of the few scales that shows a reverse solubility to increase in temperature. So meaning the higher the temperature goes, the more scale you're going to create. So this, this uh, slide here, so why scale forms. So first, we get ions in solution, and every every compound, every ion is going to have its soluble, solubilization limit. So as long as there's enough waters of solvation, they will dissolve those ions and keep them in solution and will be all nice and happy. If we keep trying to throw more of those ions into solution, we will reach supersaturation, and this will be affected by temperature and pressure. And as that goes along, we will actually get nucleation. So a calcium and a bicarbonate will come together and form calcium carbonate or a barium and a sulfate will come together and form barium sulfate. After that nucleation, you'll get several of those species meeting up with one another and they'll start forming crystals and they'll start to agglomerate. When they agglomerate, then they will find a place to, to settle out and call home. And that's where we get our scalability. Off to the side here, I've got a couple of comments about suspended solids um, in some cases. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the high school curriculum was, uh, was here, but uh, I remember my uh, ninth grade science class, one of the fun experiments we did was we, uh, we made a salt, a salt solution and then we heated it and, uh, and then we cooled it down. As we cooled it down, we dropped a single salt crystal in it and the whole thing solidified. So it was an example of the seed crystallization effect. So in some cases, even though, let's say, the ions are happily still in solution, if there's that little bit of prompting from another solid substrate that they can latch onto, that can actually exacerbate a scaling condition. So that's what that's mentioned there. Transition, transition metal ions is primarily referring to iron, and in this area, possibly a little bit aluminum, uh, which primarily due to their high charge, uh, being that they're, uh, although down the hole they can be present as their lower oxidation rate, and if the water is reused, they can be more in their higher oxidation state, which is plus three. Uh, they can attract the anionic scale and inhibiting chemistries and really mess up scale control program. You can see on the right some of the other factors that do affect whether we are going to get scale happening or not. So uh, pretty much self-explanatory temperature, pH, uh, velocity, agitation, and of course our brine composition. 
is continuing from the previous slide to how the actual scale forms. So again, we, we first get ion pairs, which form ion clusters. They will get to a critical size, and we will get that nucleation of the scale crystal. Now, I've had the, the points kind of uh, shown there in green because those are really the points in the process where scale inhibitors are going to try and disrupt the process. These next few slides are going to talk about various mechanisms to keep scale from forming, and these are the mechanisms which by the various scale inhibitors act by. And so you can see on the left we have our uh, M plus representing metal ions, so you can combine calcium, barium, strontium, iron are all metals, and X just being our we'll call it our scale pairing. <coughs> and on the right, we start to get a stronger concentration. The, the red squiggly line is meant to represent the scale inhibitor. And so as these clusters try and form together and get close, the scale inhibitor particle will, let's say, get involved in the picture. And it's just going to prevent these metal ions uniting with, the, with their counter cations. And so as you can see on the blue area, we want to push the equilibrium back to the Second mechanism is known as either crystal distortion or crystal modification. And in this case here, uh, just going back here, so now we're looking at affecting the discrete crystals part. So now we're actually starting to form crystals. So scale particles are starting to unite, they're starting to grow. And so what will happen with a crystal modifier or crystal distorting chemistry is it will start to attach itself to that growing crystal. And because it's not going to have a perfect surface, I, I like to uh, always use the analogy of think of uh, trying to build a block wall. So you've got very defined blocks, very defined shapes, and we're putting our little mortar in between. So those defined blocks, those are the scale, uh, the scale crystals growing, and that's how the scale wants to grow. But let's say, for instance, if uh, instead of putting uh, mortar in between the joints, we actually put uh, you know, irregular pieces of sponge. Well, as you start trying to put more blocks on top, what's going to happen? That things can eventually fall over because it's unstabilized. So the crystal modifiers act in a similar manner. So they are going to infiltrate into the growing scale, and they're just not going to create a surface to allow that scale to keep on growing. So crystal growth inhibition, again, um, a lot of times I lump this into crystal distortion and modification. They are very similar mechanisms. But this is going to, with certain scale crystals, where you actually have the active growth sites, the inhibitor will actually interact with the growing crystal right at the growth site. And again, it'll, it'll really block off additional ion pairs, nucleated, uh, nucleated uh, particles from attaching onto that point. And lastly, we have pure particle dispersancy. And so particle dispersancy is really going to act upon, again, growing scale molecules but that are below their critical size. So as they try and unite together, the dispersant molecule is going to interfere with them uniting together. And it creates a combination of steric hindrance and charge such that it just does not allow the scale forming crystals or the, the, the growing uh, separate crystals to agglomerate. Here, uh, many of you may have seen this type of slide before, but it's a good example of crystal modification or crystal distortion. So you see, with no additive on the left, you have very defined cubicle type shapes. On the right, we have what I refer to as fuzzy cotton balls. So, and the key with a lot, uh, and, and even going back to uh, particle dispersancy here at the end, a lot of times people have uh, scale inhibition as it's as the threshold type. So it's pure flat out solubilization and keeping all of the ions in solution. That's rarely the case, uh, especially in oil and gas, where we have so much ions in the brine, etc. 
So in a lot of cases, it's putting the scale into what we'll call a non-adherent form. Okay? And so when you look at the picture on the right, which is going to be similar for uh, somewhat similar to other mechanisms, it's what we want to do is we may not be able to keep the crystals from forming or keeping some sort of solid particulate from forming. But what the inhibitor can do is keep it flowing, keep it non-adherent. So when it finds a pipe wall or, or some other surface that it would happily like to deposit onto, the chemistry will keep it moving and it'll distort the it'll distort its structure such that it can't marry up to that surface and adhere. So just talking about the various scale inhibitor chemistries uh, that are available. Um, it's kind of interesting, I started in, uh, I guess, the oil and gas market in earnest uh, probably in the early 2000s. And at that point in time, um, fracking was still on the, the low end of, uh, of production. So a lot of uh, production was very traditional, uh, terrestrially based. I'm talking about uh, terrestrially based operations, uh, calcium carbonate is typically the main scale of concern, a little bit of barium or calcium sulfate here and there. But, and, and also the other characteristic is uh, wells were relatively shallow. And so the, the chemistries which were used by far and above over everything else were phosphate esters and phosphates. Very effective, um, work at low dose rates. Uh, they're testable because they all contain phosphorus. And, uh, and so they, they, they did well for, for many, many years. Uh, and, and they still do well. They're, they're still very good, very reliable products. And they all operate on what I'll refer to more as threshold inhibition, uh, the first mechanism I discussed. What's happened now uh, with a lot more water recycling and water reuse, uh, we're going to uh, deeper depths, so temperatures are getting higher. The, the thermal stability of phosphate esters and phosphates is typically not as good as polymeric chemistry. Um, and, and we're just getting nastier scale, uh, scaling conditions and higher ionic concentrations. So that's brought more dispersant and polymer type chemistry into the picture. So when I refer to dispersants, polyacrylates is a broad band of, of that type of chemistry uh, because there are there are homopolymer polyacrylic acids, there are copolymers, there are terpolymers which combine multiple functionalities on the molecules. And, and those products can actually st uh, function by multiple mechanisms, not just the dispersing mechanism. The crystal growth modifiers, uh, things like the PMA that I showed you the slide of, uh, PCA, also known as PPCA, uh, and there are other malleic co and terpolymers. So again, as, as we get moving in a direction more of challenging scale conditions, higher salinity brines, higher temperatures, et cetera, the movement is more towards the dispersant and crystal growth modifiers. The phosphonates still have their place, and in a lot of cases uh, are still going to be part of an overall plan, but having, having the other products in there as well uh, especially now, is very prudent. Now, factors to consider, of course, because not everybody's conditions are going to be the same. Uh, and even there's wells that are spaced apart by only a few miles that one well is a scaling well and one's not. So there's a lot of homework that has to be done uh, when we're looking at selecting uh, a scale and addition package. So among the real, what I, what I feel are the very key factors are first, let's get some water analyses. So what, what is the water we're actually going to be dealing with? What ions are there? What is the temperature? What's the temperature down pole? What's the temperature on the surface? And if there ever, ever is any history of scaling and there are samples of deposits available, the analyses of those deposits, uh, in my opinion, speaks volumes more than the analyses of the water. Because, let's say, for instance, uh, I don't know how many, well, if I had a dollar for every time I'd been told that, oh, we have no barium sulfate issue, I probably would be on an island somewhere right now. Because barium sulfate is so limited in solubility 
uh, that a lot of times people look at a water analysis and say, well, oh, no, this is great, you know, the barium is two and the sulfate is zero. Okay, um, what were they beforehand? So, cases, a lot of times the barium might have been 200 and the sulfate might have been 110. So, you can run a calculation for how many barrels of water you produced, of how much scale you formed. Okay, so, again, very important. Water analyses are great, but if we ever can get a default analysis, that tells you so much more. So again, very, very valuable. Scale prediction software, uh, again, whatever we input into that scale prediction software is, is going to tell us what we're going to get, but it's based on what we put into it. So having the most accurate information, of course, in, in something like a frack, it's, it's relatively easy because we should have a pretty good idea of the water that we're injecting down into the ground. And based on, let's say, historical results to a significant extent, we should know what the ionic character is of the formation that we're stimulating into. So we should have a good idea of what the calcium content, barium content, strontium, etc. Another key factor is temperature stability. So. As I mentioned before, uh, some of the simpler uh, scale inhibitors, once you get, let's say, above 150 degrees, uh, their, their stability will start to be challenged, all right? So uh, if you are running downhole, I know, I would say Marcellus, Utica, typically downhole, I don't believe goes much beyond 160 or 170, uh, but there are some areas such as the Haynesville and the Utica, or, I'm sorry, the Haynesville and the Eagleford, where temperatures are 350. Or higher. So having a thermally stable product is definitely a requirement. Another very key chemical compatibility. So what other chemistries are you putting into the system? Because if these aren't compatible with your scale inhibitor, you could get a canceling out effect. You could actually lose the effect of both chemistries. Um, one of the best examples of this I can bring is uh, from uh, one of my uh, time at my former employer, uh, BWA. Uh, they, were, uh, they were bidding on a very large offshore operation uh, west shore, uh, uh, off of the west coast of Africa. And the inhibitor that was supplied was somewhere around the fourth ranked in all of the scale and division testing that they ran. But once they ran the compatibility testing with all the other chemistries they were going to be pumping down the umbilical, this product won out because it was the most it was the most compatible. And so that ended up being the product of choice. So again, compatibility, very key. Uh, calcium tolerance. Uh, Marcellus has probably got the highest calciums I've seen in any of the shale regions within the US. So uh, typically anywhere from Six to eight thousand at the low end. I've seen up into the fifteen and twenty thousand range. Uh, calcium compatibility is interest is is very important just because almost all scale inhibitor chemistries can actually form a salt with calcium. Okay, it'll be dependent on pH and temperature, but it's very important that you don't lose your your actual scale inhibitor chemistry to formation as a calcium salt. Presence of other metals, as I mentioned before, iron and aluminum are fantastic scale inhibitor poisons. Uh, all scale inhibitors are anionic, net ionic, net anionic charge. So things that have a high positive charge, and again, oxidized iron, which is three plus, of course, aluminum three plus, they will tie up your scale inhibitor and they will render it essentially useless. Uh, and you'll see some, some, uh, some evidence of this couple of slides here. Uh, suspended solids, I talked about the seed crystal effect. Uh, scale inhibitors don't really discern between, let's say, a growing scale crystal and a suspended solid particle. It could even be sand. And so they're going to interact with whatever they see as a potential candidate. And so we don't want to lose our scale inhibitor dosage to things like suspended solids. So if we know that we're going to have that present, we need to factor factor that into our scale and inhibitor game plan. pH, as mentioned before, primarily for calcium carbonate, but also in general, um, again, won't, won't apply for the most part, but 
if you are ever dealing with water that has a pH below 5, some scale inhibitors will actually not ionize below that pH. Okay, so if they don't ionize, they're not scale inhibitors. Okay, they have to ionize. So pH, again, is, a, is also a concern. And of course, the mix, mixing ratio of water is that really determines uh, as uh, your, your injection water is traditionally your source of scaling anions, so your bicarbonate, your sulfate, and your your formation water or your formation makeup uh, ions, your, that's where you're going to get your barium, your calcium, your strontium, etc. So whatever previous knowledge you have of what the formation is going to give you, and of course you would have the knowledge of what the injection water has, is always key in designing the program. Here are just some results on, uh, on some Marcellus brine um, with with high levels of barium. And uh, what, what I was doing here was, uh, of course, one of, the, <clears throat> one of the holy grails of Pennsylvania has always been, can you find a way to use acid mine drainage water to frack with? Acid mine drainage water is, at the best case scenario, uh, well, with rare exception, is typically high in sulfate, is it over 1,000 ppm of sulfate? And, Formation barium is usually <clears throat> into the thousands of ppm here, so uh, quite a challenge. So I was just doing some work uh, a few years ago to see how far we could push the envelope, and so so what you see here is uh, again just showing the difference of when you get into these severe scaling conditions. So we can we have a. So a varying sulfate level, so 300 down to 150, and 3,300 uh, in change of barium. So you can see, uh, and I believe the, the actual scale inhibitor dose rate here was in the 400 to 500 ppm of field strength product. Uh, so you can see what difference you can get with a blend of polymers acting on multiple mechanisms can do versus a, a, singular, a single phosphate. The interesting thing here is, uh, which I didn't include in this slide, but I did a second set of these tests and I added 25 ppm as ferric chloride. So it gave me, uh, I added enough ferric chloride to give me 25 ppm of ferric iron. And it basically <coughs> tore all these numbers down by another 50%. So again, just to really show how much iron can mess up your scale inhibitor. set of results where there was pretty strong tendency for both calcium carbonate and barium sulfate. And so again, uh, there was a lot of suspended solids and a lot of iron, a lot of iron here. They were filtered out to uh, just below 10 ppm. Uh, but again, the purpose of this here is using several different polymeric-based inhibitor blends there was only one product that was able to get the barium above 250. So, very challenging water. Uh, again, the point I'm trying to drive across is putting several different molecules into play is going to give you a better chance and using, utilizing all of those scale inhibition mechanisms uh, is going to give you the best chance at being able to work with a fluid like this. So just to summarize, uh, so we know that there are various types of scale species that can form. Uh, for the most part, if you do run into things like iron oxide, iron sulfide, calcium carbonate, even calcium sulfate, those are fairly easy to remediate with, with various acids. Uh, even calcium sulfate, uh, usually glycolic acid, aka hydroxyacetic acid, is quite effective at removing it. Barium sulfate, on the other hand, is very problematic to remove. You normally need a very strong chelant solution, and sometimes it's it's uh, it, it, it's almost more uh, more cost effective to do uh, uh, some remedial work with the tubing. So it's very important that we try and prevent, especially barium sulfate, where we have that as a potential scale to form. As we discussed, there's a lot of factors to be considered, not just how much of this ion do I have and how much of that ion do I have. 
need to look at several things. Temperature, what other chemistries go in there, uh, pressures, etc. And then finally I'll conclude with when running scale inhibition tests. Uh, traditionally there are two primary methods, either static jar tests or dynamic scale loop tests. Although the dynamic scale loop tests are uh, they're not as commonplace, uh, usually the major service companies have these in their labs, and there are a few third-party labs who have them. Uh, they are the most reliable data that you can get by far, because they are creating and mimicking the flow that you would get in a system. The, the jar test, the, the, they are they can still be very effective, and they can be very they can be done in fairly short order. Uh, the, the key with a JAR test is that if you follow the NACE procedure to the letter, then you can actually come up with a failed inhibitor test when you've actually passed the test. And the reason for that is that the NACE procedure calls for you to filter out any solid particulate that forms. But as we saw before, you can still form solid particulate that's in a non-adherent form and you're inhibiting scale while you're doing that. So, but on the NACE test, you're actually going to pull that out and you're going to get a lower scale inhibition rate. Okay, so one of the tricks that I would always advise customers is that when you do a jar test, if the water appears to be more as a haze, that you actually can't really see any discrete particles, but it's just a haze, then that's actually a good thing. That's your scale inhibition mechanism at work. If you actually see discrete scale particles forming and starting to fall to the bottom, well, that's a bad thing. So, uh, but again, th those uh, those are the two main tests, and uh, again, dynamic scale uh, loop testing, wherever you possibly can do it, is is highly recommended. Uh, in the jar test, just keep that in mind that doing the filtration can give you a slightly erroneous or can give you some misleading information. So take observations of how this will be And I believe that is it. So I thank you all for your attention.